honest, we shot enough for probably three episodes. Yeah, I kind of thought so. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, the information was really sensitive. It was really, it was David and I sitting in the chair. We were feeling your emotions and pain. It was, mm -hmm. you know, so I think it was condensed into the one episode. You know, because of you know the nature of some of the trauma that you had been through and that you're reporting. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that, and that you know, mm -hmm. you know, uh, re recovering those memories is a, a very traumatic thing, especially when you do not, uh, when it comes in chunks, and you don't have a way to make sense of it or assign it to an incident. Mm -hmm. You have un, uh, PTSD with no real real reason for the severity of it exactly is usually how it happens so mm -hmm. the first question is when did you realize that you had been blank slated or mind wiped mm -hmm. um, and had um, your first memories come back how did that happen well like I said in my presentation I was talking with a friend about and he said what well, basically he said that he noticed whenever the military my military background came up, I would kind of skate away to a different subject. You know, I, have, I was unconsciously avoiding it. And so he sat me down one afternoon and he said, tell me about your military time, is that okay? And I said, sure, no problem. And I said, I went into uh, Lackland Air Force Base, uh, 1979 in, I think, April. And uh, then I went to Keesler Air Force Base for technical training school. And then uh, I went home for a while on leave for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then I uh, went to Nellis Air Force Base and uh, started my duty station there. And I worked at Tonopah. And then about the time I said I worked at Tonopah, I realized that Tonopah was a big blank. It was just a big blank. And I couldn't remember anything. And I was like, Ugh, you know, how does that happen? Because I have a really good memory. You know, I couldn't remember anything about working at Tonopah, and I know that I worked there for three or four months. And so it was, I, I just didn't know, but I, I did have a wave of nausea just sweep over me at the, real, at the recognition that I couldn't remember what had happened during that time. It was really frightening to have a, this big black hole in my memory. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so when the first memory started coming back, what was it like? Well, I didn't get the memory back until uh, the hypnosis session with Bud Hopkins. And I know people look askance at hypnosis, and, and I'm sure that there are ways to implant suggestions. But I have to say, Bud tried to actually lead me away from what I was recounting. He said, well, was it with this thing over here? Was it this thing over here? And, and I would stay right on what I was experiencing and just kept reporting it. And uh, it, was, it was just staggering, yeah. the things well, that came out. When you were reporting your memory, was it more like you were narrating a story, or did you have immediately emotional ties to those memories? I had emotional ties. It was very emotional. Um, and I remember uh, laying there feeling rigid at what was coming out of me. Just, just rigid, like, ah, you know, what is this? Where, what's coming out of me? And, it, and the emotional power of what I was feeling as I was recounting what had happened was unmistakable. It was, you know, there was no way to really doubt it after this. I mean, after, after that session, uh, that information just had a hold of me in such a way that I had to find out more. And I didn't even do any more hypnosis until 2003. So from 1994 to 2003, I just was trying to figure out what happened with the session with Bud. You just had the one session? Just the one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. It was all I could handle. <laughs> well, I guess you answered this question, if there were any signs of uh, the memories coming back. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you mentioned that until you talked to your friend about your service, mm -hmm. you really didn't have any memories. You just saw a, a, a big chunk missing out of your memories. Yeah, I didn't really have the memories then. Um, but I was very scared that I didn't have the memory. 
Right. But it really scared scared the heck out of me. Now, after the, the session that you had, the regression session, mm -hmm. in the coming weeks afterwards, did you have more memories that were tied to the memories you recovered that were coming back? Mm -hmm. Or uh, did you have to do a lot of, were they coming back automatically or did you have to uh, seek the memories? Well, there have been flashbacks. Yeah. And, you know, not associated with hypnosis. Um, like, for instance, uh, I used to have really bad allergies, you know, like really severe, you know, springtime hay fever type mm -hmm. of allergies, where I would have to sleep sitting up just to be able to breathe at all. And the congestion here would get so bad that um, not just the sinuses were congested in lockdown, but it was almost like the capillaries of under the skin in this area were also warmed. And that warming sensation over my nose and mouth, for some reason that just made me panic. And um, the memories that have come out of that that were not from hypnosis were of that blonde security guard I wrote about in my book uh, smothering me. Uh, he would do this until and smother me until I lost consciousness. And I didn't know if I was ever going to wake up. Um, but it's come back like a piece at a time from the flashbacks. And then, you know, just kind of realizing. And I'm still realizing things about it today, but I'd rather not talk about them because they're, they're pretty ugly. Um, I yeah. would imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I guess it made sense. It helped to make sense of, of my life before remembering anything of all the, the stuff that I didn't realize was PTSD at the time. But I would have anxiety and I'd have, you know, I'd get angry about things and, uh, <clears throat> and I couldn't really pin it down. And it, and it nearly drove me to suicide uh, about age 33 because I was living with anxiety at that point that uh, I didn't know how to deal with. And I thought, I'm just making my, I'm making my family miserable, I'm miserable, you know, there's really, there really isn't any good to this existence. And so I actually planned to do it. And then when I sat down and, and thought about it, thought the whole thing of suicide through, I realized I couldn't go through with it uh, because spiritually, it's a really bad choice. Well, is this after the memories returned? No, this was before. Okay. This was before the memories came back. Um, but I feel like I was guided to recovering the memories in one form or another because when I decided not to commit suicide that day at age 33, I committed myself to facing whatever I needed to face to heal. And when you make that kind of a commitment to yourself, the universe starts to line up the people, places, and situations to help you uh, accomplish your goal, which at that point was to heal. After these memories, after the regression therapy session and mm -hmm. the memories returned, mm -hmm. how did you begin to integrate that information into your reality? Well, it was pretty tough. Uh, for a while, I just went through life, like I said, looking over my shoulder because I thought, if somebody didn't want me to remember this, um, if they did some kind of memory wipe on me and they didn't want me to remember us, this, they may have been monitoring me to see if I would ever remember anything. And so I became kind of paranoid, looking over my shoulder all the time. Mm. Um, I remember one time sitting down with, uh, with uh, crypto researcher John Rhodes at uh, Denny's. And I remember talking to him and looking over my shoulder all the time and looking at other people sitting at other tables to see if they were listening to me or looking at me in any way. I mean, I was really uh, pretty jumpy for a while. Yeah, I remember when, Cosmic, when I first started shooting Cosmic Disclosure, mm -hmm. I, I went through a very similar thing. Yeah. I mean, I would actually worry that at some point I was going to be picked up, mind wiped, and then put back. <clears throat> that would keep me from reporting any further information and would probably be a way to discredit me. So that was one of the things I was really worried about. Mm -hmm. I thought that they were going to re-abduct me, do a, a mind wipe, and then put me back and you know set me up for ridicule. 
-hmm. Fortunately, that never happened. They yeah. didn't, you know, the Air Force, when they picked me up the first few times to do the chemical interrogations, they would do um, a, uh, I guess, a low-level mind wipe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, did you share these memories with family and friends, or did you do what most people do? You just kind of buried it and, and, and dealt with it on your own? Yeah, mostly I buried it and dealt with it on my own. You know, some of it I just couldn't speak about to certain people, you know, certain people that are really mainstream. And th that kind of stuff is pretty crazy making to them. So yeah. I just kept quiet about it until I found safe people to talk to. And what I did. People like these. Yeah, people like yeah. this. <laughs> and <laughs> I think that's why we're all coming together. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I would go to every. In Las Vegas, Nevada, there was a lot going on in that time. And so I went to every talk, every lecture, everything I could where something might come to me that would explain what the heck happened to me out there and why. And so in going to those events is when I, I met people like Misha Johnston and other people that really helped me uh, to try to start piecing together this fractured part of my life. I know something similar happened to me, but mm -hmm. when your book came out, was mm -hmm. the cat kind of out of the bag to your family? Did they find out about it immediately? Pretty much. Um, my family doesn't pay a lot of attention to it. You know, it's kind of beyond them, is what they would say. And, you know, because my, you know, my mother, my father passed away in 1976, so he didn't ever get involved with it. But, you know, I did speak about it to my mother a little bit after I'd gone public because it felt like, you know, it's public anyway. She's going to hear something probably. And I did do a, uh, I did a uh, interview in Shadow, uh, an supposedly anonymously in the Dreamland documentary that came out in 1996. But they didn't hide my identity very well at all. And I was both furious and terrified that they hid my identity so badly because anybody that knew it was me knew that was me on the screen. And I had people coming up to me at that time, and then when they re-aired the documentary other times, people would come up and say, was that you on that UFO show? And I'd have to say, yeah, it was, you know. Yeah, I was, I had a similar situation where I was sort of outed and I wasn't mm -hmm. ready, and yeah. that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that, you know, a few of my family members have found out, I guess, what I'm doing now. Uh, mm -hmm. I think everyone knows, but they don't want to acknowledge it or talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want the uncomfortable conversations to come up. But yeah. the one person that did talk to me, and I won't say who it was, called me up and they said, I've seen all of the stuff you're talking about on the internet, about aliens and inner earth. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I want that around my house because I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and of course, I've gotten a few, a few of the, you know, they're worried about my soul and all these other things. Uh -huh. So, well indoctrinated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, coming out and reporting this information, that's something you think about. Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. I thought long and hard about how it was going to affect my immediate family, my children, uh -huh. you know, how they were going to get locked into that persona, you know. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. You know, children of the contactee or, you know, the blue chicken cult leader or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, I thought about it long and hard. Now, I definitely knew, you know, my grandfather was a, a minister. I actually went to school to be a minister for a little while. I knew that it was going to be a major shock to my family. Mm -hmm. And as I said on Cosmic Disclosure, I think, I expected them to do an intervention to invite me over for Thanksgiving, and then, you know, there'd be a pastor, uh, one or two psychiatrists, you know, eight-foot-tall blue birds. That's a pretty interesting thing for a psychiatrist. And for them to sit me down and have an intervention, that hasn't happened. Yeah. I, I think this information is so bizarre for them, they just don't even want to approach it. Mm -hmm. It's so much out of their reality bubble. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that was a major step. Was I mean, did you really think about how your family would react or was it just mm -hmm. this was a mission you had to write the book for your own healing? Well, my family had problems of severe codependency 
and alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And were you in a military family? Um, my dad was in the army in World War yeah. II. Yeah, it seems to be uh, yeah mm -hmm. something you run into. My same mm -hmm. with my family. Yeah, and uh, so I just. <clears throat> I didn't really think about what they were doing because the first chance I got, I moved way far away from my family because um, I needed to get my head screwed on straight from all their dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And so I moved way far away and uh, to the Southwest and they were in Ohio. And I didn't want to hurt them. Um, and then in 1993, I did the Solara 1111 uh, opening the gateway event and the reason I did it was because I was born the 11th month 11th day at 11 a.m. Mm. and I thought maybe I should be part of this 11 thing and uh, <clears throat> I'm noticing the 11s are coming up again tomorrow <laughs> yeah. you know and uh, so I just you know, I kind of disconnected from my family, not in a heart way, but, you know, I had to get clear of their dysfunction to get myself together. Yeah, you have to pull yourself out of that energy to be able yeah. to recover from it. Right. And uh, so I felt kind of like a free agent after a while that I could pretty much do what I needed to do. But during the Solara 1111 thing, I had to do a meditation for my star name. And my, I was born Janet Marie Isley. And then the, the name I got during this uh, Solara event was Niara Terela. It was real interesting how it came. It sounded like little bells that I heard in my inner ear that finally formed into the words Niara Terela. And I made it a legal change. And then later on, I was glad that I made the legal change of my name because then I thought, if I do go public with this stuff, at least I'm not wearing the same name that I had with my family of origin. Yeah, I, I tried to use a little bit of a pseudonym mm -hmm. too for a while, mm -hmm. but yeah. it didn't work for mm -hmm. very long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all in my book. I've tried to be as transparent as possible in my book. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now all of a sudden, after reg regression therapy, mm -hmm. you have all these extremely traumatic memories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you... How did you begin to process that pain and energy? Was it through writing your book, or did you have a, a much more personal way of beginning to deal with those traumas? Well, I guess the first thing I did was um, I just let myself feel it because really I couldn't feel anything else. I had a hypnosis, two more long hypnosis sessions with someone in 2003, and after I got back home from those, I remember pretty much just sitting on my sofa for a month with my arms up around my knees, kind of rocking back and forth, mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, oh my God. And, and I just would feel this panic just welling up in me because the images in my head were me. This was happening to me. And it was just horrific. You know, like the, the things that happened on the moon. You know, not being allowed to sleep which is part of a mind control technique, and being worked very hard during the day and then being uh, used at night for sex. You know, pretty nasty. Were you able to find a therapist to help you through this or um, a trusted friend? Because dealing with these memories, especially when their memories mm -hmm. that you've recovered. Mm -hmm. It's, I guess, any anyone that has had trauma that they've put out of their lives and they've lost the memories tied to those. Mm -hmm. It's it's amazing how much energy and how much emotion are are tied to these memories. Mm -hmm. When you revisit the memories now, over time, has that energy reduced any? Has there been that type of healing, or it, it or, has. Um, except when new things come out. And there have been some new things that have come out over the last two or three months that um, I'm, I'm having difficulty with, but I'm coming to grips with it. I thought, well, I've come to grips with so much, I can come to grips with this too. Basically, I didn't want to approach a therapist because who, who are they, you know? What is their background? What's their indoctrination? Right. Are they going to think that I'm crazy and lock me up? You know, so I kind of avoided... Uh, I did see therapists, but I didn't tell them about this material. 
And what I did was I just kind of made it a solo journey where I would read books on, you know, how to recover from trauma and try to implement the, te the techniques myself. And um, I had to be very, I, I felt like I had to be very, very careful who I opened up to. Why, why did you write the book? Well, like I said in my talk, people kept getting hung up on this uh, horror story of what happened to me. Every interview I did, I had to rehash the memories and say it all over again. And, you know, it got easier to tell the story, but probably every fifth to tenth time I had to tell it yet again, it would hit me again real hard. And, and then I thought, you know, there's all these other things I've put together with understanding that there's a shadow government and all this other stuff, and then put together with my own spiritual insight process. Um, I finally thought, this telling of the horror story over and over and over again, this is not what I want my life to be about. And so at that point, I wrote the book because I had gotten a significant enough amount of healing by the time I started writing the book that I wanted to share that with other people who have been through similar things to me to help them. Plus, I really wanted, you know, we don't need to be tearing our planet up looking for more fossil fuels and destroying our planet by burning them into the atmosphere. We have free energy. You know, we don't need to be destroying our planet. But why are we still destroying our planet? And it's really because... <clears throat> The oil cartels have such a stranglehold on the economy that they don't want this free energy to come out because their whole house of cards will fall down. Since you started speaking publicly, have you, have you been contacted by the Air Force or anyone representing themselves as trying to, um, I guess, keep you quiet? Not in any overt way, but when I spoke at the Super Soldier Conference uh, a few years ago, um, it became apparent that many of us speaking at that con uh, conference were picked up and messed with in our sleep, you know, when we were asleep. And I woke up in the morning with a very strange bruise right here. So I have a friend that does quantum healing hypnosis also, and we trade sessions. And when we looked at that information, when they took me in the middle of the night at that conference with like Melinda Leslie and some other folks, um, they had used some kind of pen-like instrument and put it in here uh, very hard to do a brain scan to try to determine what was going on chemically in the brain that would uh, remove their blocks that they had put in the way of my memory. Just at least that's the way I've understood it. Well, it's true that a lot of people want to hear the horror story. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a lot of times when people speak to me privately, that's where they, you know, try to, to go in the conversation mm -hmm. is, you know, with the, the horror story, story part. Mm -hmm. But what I'm finding is now the majority of people, they want to hear how you healed from the horror story. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the information that you're reporting is, uh, yeah, it's definitely a horror story, mm -hmm. but uh, the beautiful part is you reporting how you've recovered from it and been able to function again. Mm -hmm. I really did what I said in the title of the book. I faced the shadow. Everything that I felt afraid of, I felt might have a clue to my recovery. So I would look at everything that I was afraid of. If there was something I was really afraid to look at, I would look at it. Yeah, that's what um, I did too. Because I had to face it, I had to walk myself through it so that it would lose its power over me. Because if you turn away from it, it just stays locked inside of you and you stay afraid. No matter how much denial you try to pile on top of it, the fear is still in there. Yeah, so, I, I've known victims of yeah. mm -hmm. uh, trauma that um, are still, the, the people are still, still subject to the people that caused the trauma, mm -hmm. even though some of the people that caused the trauma had been dead mm -hmm. 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. But the, it was very much alive in their psyche. Yeah. So having to deal, being forced to deal with those traumas is, I think, mm -hmm. 
it's a very rough process, but mm -hmm. I don't think anyone can escape it right now. Yeah, no, I don't think so. Do you think that, I guess you've seen um, kind of what's happening with anyone that's talking about these experiences, they get attacked viscerally. Do you think that, how much do you think of that as just the natural reaction to people's reality bubbles being violated? And how much do you think of it as coordinated by an agency or a group? Well, probably 50-50, uh, depending on what kind of information it's like. Um, you know what I said in my presentation about filling in the little bubbles on the standardized testing? One of the things I read about standardized testing was in Transformation of America by uh, Kathy O'Brien and Mark Phillips. And he said that they look at all that standardized testing and try to figure out where would this child fit within our organization or where they Profile. fit. Yeah. yeah, profiling. And so when I, you know, just kind of went into my indigo la la land and did my own thing, they probably thought, well, she's probably just an airhead and probably is of no use to anybody anywhere. <laughs> Maybe, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that, but um, I don't think that uh, anybody in the powers that be ever suspected what would come out of me later on in life that has come out of me, you know. I'm intelligent and very well educated, self-educated, because I went above and beyond in all the areas of learning that really interested me. So I'm really well educated by my own hand, so to speak. And I've put a lot together, and I don't think they saw it coming. I don't think they saw that book coming out of me. Yeah, I, I don't think they saw um, a lot of things coming. You yeah. know, Tompkins and mm -hmm. a few others. That if I think they get very arrogant about their ability to control. And then oh, yeah. when somebody comes out with, like me with my book, and you with your information, it's like, holy cow, you know? Yeah. Why don't they keep coming? underestimating us? Yeah. Yes, for sure. <laughs> what types of, I mean, I think we've been seeing it recently, but what types of tactics are used to suppress uh, people that are talking about this information? Mm -hmm. um, trying to scare them, you know, threatening them, threatening their loved ones, threatening their economic well-being. Um, which is pretty scary because we see a lot in the media and on Facebook things posted about uh, being poor and homeless is almost being criminalized. Yeah. So if your economic life is destroyed and you have nowhere to go, I mean, there are people that are arresting those that are trying to feed the hungry or house the homeless. You know, you can't do that. Well, what are the homeless and the hungry supposed to do? Just lay down and die in the street? No. Yeah, I've mm -hmm. been finding that since they have less and less to use against people like us, that they mm -hmm. just resort to mockery. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. that's pretty much mainly mm -hmm. what you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like all the things I was looking at for my presentation, like when I looked up stuff about what the bleep that I wanted to review, you know, inevit inevitably everything I looked up that I wanted to put in my presentation, there was another video saying debunking uh, what the bleep do we know? Debunking right. this, debunking Greg Braden his emotions and DNA. There was a, debunking everything, you know, just to throw a monkey wrench in there and show people that, well, that's all nonsense. Yeah. And it I, will I've, appeal to the indoctrinated, but it's not going to appeal to the truth seekers. Yeah, I've heard there's one or two videos like that about me out there. But yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I've heard a rumor of it anyway. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's happened to me too, you yeah. know, a little bit, but I just don't pay any attention. I just stand in my truth and mm. speak it. And Well, sadly, ridicule works for most of society. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. all, you know, oh, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, my brethren are ridiculing it. I better lock in with them and ridicule mm -hmm. it as well, or mm -hmm. at least ignore it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What can the public do to support people like us that are coming forward? I know there's a big debate between, uh, you know, nuts and bolts mm -hmm. and experiencer types. Mm -hmm. You know, the nuts and bolts types are, you know, it, it has to fall out of the sky, cause a small brush fire, and have a serial number on it to exist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've talked to a few of them, and 
suggested that if they were standing outside looking for this type of evidence and mm -hmm. a craft landed yeah. and mm -hmm. the, the beings spoke to them, the inhabitants spoke to them, then um, their threshold for what they consider the truth would be quite a bit different than if mm -hmm. they were just in that laboratory environment all the time. That's yeah. why it's been so hard to bridge the gap mm -hmm. between experiencers and the nuts and bolts types because yeah. they have to mm -hmm. see it, feel it. Mm -hmm. And once they do, it becomes a part of their, I guess, their truth. Well, I'm kind of similar. I have to have direct experience of something to, ex to accept it as real and, and true for myself. Right. But I have a broader uh, view of what personal experience is for me on not just a physical nuts and bolts level, but on a spiritual level. Sometimes you have a spiritual experience that takes hold of you and you cannot deny it. You cannot deny it. Like one time in a college Spanish class, I'm sitting there doing, you know, repeating, you know, como esta, and everything else like that. And suddenly, it's like this love energy from the universe just hit me like a lightning bolt. Immediately, my face is drenched with tears, and it feels so wonderful to feel that love voltage pouring through me. Um, how can I express that to someone else? I can't. You know, I'd have to do a Vulcan mind meld with somebody to get them to understand yeah. the power of that experience. But for me, it's real. Well, these, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these nuts and bolt type people, mm -hmm. if they have an experience like that, they will do everything they can to find a nuts and bolts reason for it. You mm -hmm. know, I guess yeah. if you're a hammer, every problem is a nail. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them you know, do not have that balance of being mm -hmm. pragmatic and spiritual. Mm -hmm. They, some of them I've talked to don't believe they really have an intuition or never listened to it, have never right. developed it. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, so, you know, it's, it's going to be kind of hard to bridge the gap. There are going to have to be some major changes before mm -hmm. people of this type are able to come closer to, mm -hmm. to where we are. Yeah, well, I guess we're just going to have to let spirit take care of them in their own good time, All right. because it will come to them eventually. Their soul, too. Right. Mm -hmm. The information that each of us is reporting, it's, you know, it's starting to reach a larger and larger audience, but mm -hmm. for the most part, we've been preaching to the choir. Most of the people that we talk to, mm -hmm. they already have had experiences or they believe that ETs are visiting. Mm -hmm. um, how do we affect the rest of the mass consciousness? How do we begin to get this information to them in a way that they can process it and grow from it? Mm -hmm. I think by just being ourselves and, and standing strong in our truth, um, it's not, to me, like I said in my talk, it's not about convincing someone or trying to entice them or seduce them into our way of thinking. It's just being an example of what our experiences have created in us. And it will either attract or repel. Um, but eventually the people that are repelled by it are going to have to face the fact that there is something energetic going on. And quantum science is really a really good way to do it because it's nuts and bolts science that's actually proving that consciousness has an effect at the subatomic level on reality. And, you know, if, if you look at it and you're a nuts and bolts person, you have to start looking at the, at the sheer amount of evidence that consciousness does affect reality. And that's, that's the opening of the door to me for the nuts and bolts types to open up to what may be within themselves. Agreed, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why science in general has have hidden things like the observer effect mm -hmm. from the rest of the scientific community. Yeah, you know, scientists they, you know, after doing experiment after experiment, each of them start picking up on, you know, I'm consciously interacting with the experiment and having an effect on it. Mm -hmm. So I think each of them have had some sort of an experience with it, but even within science, there is so much that is suppressed. Mm -hmm. So I they, they, a lot of them just don't have a chance because they haven't been given the full amount of information as they're creating these neural pathways when they're mm -hmm. going through school. Yeah, once upon a time, when I was much younger, I was kind of a nuts and bolts person because I studied a lot of, you know, 
regular hardcore science with you know the regular scientific method um, but instinctively down in my gut I knew there had to be a place where science and spirituality wove together and when I found quantum mechanics that helped me make the leap that I wanted to make from as a spiritual being I think it's also to I guess practice what you preach mm -hmm. to be to live an example, live the example that you're speaking about. That's mm -hmm. one of the things that um, Kari had mentioned to me is that mm -hmm. there are many in this community, usually the people that are up here talking to, to the community, that have all of these intellectual, um, they, they have it down intellectually, you know, about ascension, about spirituality, mm -hmm. but they're not applying it. Yeah. And we end up seeing that in people, in their behavior and, and, mm -hmm. and the problems that they have. Yeah. Um, and that's a big problem. That's a problem in, um, you know, like when I was going to church, mm -hmm. you know, there were people that, you know, on Sundays they would come in and, and beam brightly and then, you know, walk out to the car and, you know, cuss all the way home. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, we, we have the, the same thing going on in our community mm -hmm. and, um, um, you know, what we really have to do is, if we're going to be out here talking about forgiveness, um, raising our vibration, mm -hmm. then we, we've really got to show those around us that that's the path that we're taking. Yeah. And, it, mm -hmm. and they're going to have to see us, uh, you know, holding our knees, rocking, crying, mm -hmm. going through the painful process. Because a lot of times people mm -hmm. think that, you know, a lot of people think that the process I've gone through, the metamorphosis, has been like this rule. He's talking to aliens and he's losing weight and going through this metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. When in the background, it wasn't that comfortable. You know, yeah. I, it was a very, mm -hmm. um, they, were, they were pointing out all of my shadows mm -hmm. and expecting me to deal with them. Yeah. So that, I mean, may, the, the main way I think that we can raise the consciousness one person at a time is to emanate the change that we want to be exactly you know you want to attract people by who you are if you're a person of heart and conscience and love then you're going to radiate that and that becomes very attractive to people who are ready to be attracted to that right and the people that are repelled by it you know they just need a little more time with their own shit so yeah. to speak to uh figure out that maybe we have something that they need. But a warning, when you're going through that process, who also is a, attracted to you are narcissists and sociopaths. Yes, I so know that too. That's one of the things that, uh -huh. why I, I state that uh -huh. you can be loving and forgiving, but do not be a doormat. You know, uh -huh. you've got to stand up for your own sovereignty. Uh -huh. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I've had narcissists uh, come into my life trying to attach. Oh, yeah, right. And we're, we're ripe. Mm -hmm. we, when mm -hmm. we beam that energy to loving beings, they return it. Mm -hmm. But um, the, uh, the damaged people see us mm -hmm. as low-hanging fruit to be easily exploited. Yeah, and I had one narcissist. We have to show them that they, we're not going to allow that to happen. Yeah, I had one narcissist that wanted to get involved with me a few years ago. We were involved for a couple of months, and then who he was became so apparent that I, I boogied out of there. And then I read five books on narcissistic personality disorder <laughs> so that I would never, yeah. ever again be taken in. It's amazing how long they can hide it. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So from the process that you've gone through, mm -hmm. what advice can you give the star seeds, wanderers, and also mm -hmm. people that have had have suppressed memories that they're either dealing with now or they're going to have to deal with when mm -hmm. they go through this process. What advice do you have for them? Um, to be gentle with yourself mm -hmm. and take it only as quickly as you can. You know, with me, it was a big ripping away of my re my my former reality, and then being shoved rudely into a new reality. But still, I had to have been ready to discover that I had missing time. And then from there, I had to be ready to look and see what was going on. And yes, it was really rough. Yeah. It was like being thrown down the rabbit hole. And uh, it was a bumpy ride. But obviously, I was up to it because I'm still here. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess you have to go through the, through the, pro through the process of 
accept, I mean, accepting the pain that you're mm -hmm. going to have to go through in the yeah. process. Uh -huh. You have to accept what's happened to you. You have to accept all your feelings. You have to learn to love all your feelings. And, and you know, it's not like you come to this perfect place where now I have self-love and I shall have self-love forevermore. It's, it's a process where you approach it and you feel good in that place and then something will come to knock you out of it and then you have to find your way back. But every time you find your way back to that self-love place, you're stronger there. You stand in that place longer and longer. And then it takes something bigger to whack you out. But, you know, you just have to follow your heart and your gut, you know, and trust that because that's the only real thing that you can trust. Yeah, I was pulled into dark places several times in this process. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm talking about before I started speaking publicly. I mean, I mean the transformation that I've gone through is, uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing. Mm -hmm. Literally four years ago, I had such a different energy, energy about me and in my eyes that no one here would want to be anywhere near my field. It was very frazzled, so much anger, so much pain uh, that I hadn't dealt with, and I was just radiating it into the environment around me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking back at how I was just even three years ago, it's, you know, it can be very humbling and disappointing, you know, to look at, you know, at, at the way you behaved. I understand completely. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. But people seeing that side of you, your past, and mm -hmm. seeing where you are now, mm -hmm. it shows them that it can be done. And especially when they hear the amount of trauma that you've been through and how far you've come, yeah. it, it gives them hope that they can apply that to their lives and mm -hmm. escape that trauma. Yeah, another so. reason why I wrote the book, because I yeah. wanted to be that example for people that need that level of healing. I think that is the purpose of starseeds in general, mm -hmm. is to, to be here and to be an example. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't have our memories. We, we're not down here interfering in free will. Mm -hmm. We're down here just being a mirror or an example. Right. Mm -hmm. Why is unity so important right now? I mean, if we don't unify, mm -hmm. what's the big deal? Well, I'll give a scientific explanation first. Um, there's a scientist who was in What the Bleep, Dean Rodden, who's one of the chief scientists that works at the Institute for Noetic Sciences. And what he has found is the more people that are gathered together in an intentional process, the better chance that intention has of actualizing. And he said, the way he explained it in the video that I saw said, you could buy a lotto ticket, you could pour tons of intention and energy onto it that you picked the right numbers and you're going to win it, and then the day comes and you check the numbers and oops, you didn't win. That's because the rest of the seven billion people on the planet the were not intention. on board with you <laughs> in that intention. Right. Yeah, so that's why unification is so important. Even, even Jesus said, when two or more are gathered in my name, um, the power of intention is exponentially magnified. That's why it is so important to put our differences aside, not to become somebody different or come this homogenized, mindless whole, but it is important to open your heart and accept differences in others and come together on the common ground and, and, and work to make a better earth. So for starters. We become more powerful if we unify. Yes. And um, I guess we see different proxies being used in the community and close to the community to prevent exactly that. Mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. and, you know, when we tried to form the Full Disclosure Project a year ago, mm -hmm. we had a person that um, I, contacted everyone we're trying to work with and, dis and discouraged them from working with us. Mm -hmm. And um, it worked to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And then we try this unity push again, mm -hmm. and you see what has happened. So yeah. if they do not want us to unify, then mm -hmm. that, 
that should, that should tell us quite a bit that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, by unifying, that's, that's how we're going to defeat yeah. them. If you look at everything in our environment and that's put out to us in the media, it is all about dividing and conquering. It's all about making people fight with each other. And the big question you have to ask is why? Why have, keep people fighting with each other? Why have them at each other's throats? Well, yeah, it's an ancient, um, I mean, Sun Tzu kind of tactic, and mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. um, this morning we were listening, I don't know if you're here listening to Vivian Davis talk, and she talked about uh, when she was at Standing Rock, mm -hmm. some of the uh, former military types had come together, mm -hmm. and then they were infiltrated. Yes. And this infiltrator came in, got their respect, and then started finding ways to get them to infight. Mm -hmm. And that broke up the cohesiveness yeah. of... Uh, what, what they were trying to achieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, we have to do whatever it takes to keep mm -hmm. that from happening. The powers that be are so afraid of seven billion people rising up and coming after their ass, excuse my French, <laughs> that they have to keep us fighting with each other so that we don't turn on them. Oh, yeah, they know they'll be hanging from lampposts. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, not necessarily, because what we need to do is forgive them yeah. and love yeah. them. Yeah, we do, but the vast majority of mm -hmm. people out there are yeah. not in that space, sadly. I understand that, That's, too. Disclosure mm -hmm. can be a very mm -hmm. horrifying process for a lot mm -hmm. of us. We'll, we'll probably see some very horrifying things play out on television that we're used to only seeing in history books from World War II. Yeah, there was opinion. something I wrote a long time ago, and it was this. You cannot use the tools and methods of the enemy to defeat the enemy, without becoming the enemy. And then if you win, you still lose. Right. Uh, oh, looks like we're ready to do a Q and A. Okay. Thank you for joining us this weekend. Thank you for having me very much. And your book is for sale in the back of the room? Yes, it's in sale in the yeah, back. Yeah, I hope room. everyone will pick up a copy. Mm -hmm. Maybe Thanks. you can get it or sign it. Thank you. I have 44 copies, so mm -hmm. that's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Had 44 copies, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Sean, um, and um, I've had a rocky, you know, up and down um, life cycle um, becoming a healer. And um, my default setting started out, you know, loving everybody, and um, then, you know, I put on a harder shell, and I was like, yeah, no, it's just so much. I enjoy it more loving people. So I just totally reclaimed that and I'm like, <laughs> uh, I'm just going to love people. And it's not always easy, but um, I'm hearing enough stories from David Wilcock and you and you um, that are being tricked by narcissists. And I'm like, is it that easy to fake just like? total open-heartedness? Yeah, sadly it is. Yeah, <laughs> they, it is. Over a lifetime, they become very adept at uh, pretending that they have the same emotions. Mm -hmm. um, it's something they develop in childhood to be able to blend in. So they become very good at hiding their true self. And it usually takes a good three to six months to even begin to, to catch on. Mm -hmm. So sadly, people that are very empathetic and loving are pulled into those parasitic relationships mm -hmm. and they the beings that are basically controlling them or attached to them are leashing us and they're getting some sort of an energetic kickback from these beings so this leash is shared with them and they it's kind of like heroin they then they get addicted to it so yeah they become very adept at uh, hiding themselves so they can get their fix mm -hmm. They're drug consummate, ad, drug consummate addicts, actors. Yeah, drug addicts are known for doing, you know, the same thing. So you guys aren't starting to develop 
any kind of like, I don't know, hair standing up in the back of your neck? Or? But usually you, you, it's hard to listen to them. You'll, you'll get right. these little, little pings, but right. everything you're seeing and experiencing with them contradicts it. Mm-hmm. So once you've had enough experience with them, then like she studied, that's always a good idea. Mm-hmm. Know all the signs of a narcissist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the minute you start seeing those signs in your life, it's time to bail. Mm-hmm. You know, but you have to educate yourself. Yeah, sometimes they use very cryptic language that sounds really, somehow, it, it has like this wise veneer on it, but it's very cryptic, and then it knocks you off balance, which is the first warning sign. It kind of knocks you off balance to think, well, what are they trying to say? And you try to understand, and the more you try to understand, you open yourself to their game, their con. And once they get that far with you, and then they work to keep you off balance so that you never really recover yourself. So that's one of their tricks. And, they're, and again, they're consummate actors and actresses, and um, I, I would advise that you read up on narcissism and, and really read, you know, find out what they're really all about, and you'll, you, you will be less, far less likely to fall into the trap. And then... You will spot them um, fairly fairly easily once you, once you get to know them. At some point, you'll you'll see the, see it in their eyes, mm-hmm. even though they're they can hide that energy as well. But you you develop the ability. I mean, I worked around so many mm-hmm. sociopaths and narcissists in the programs. Either and the people that weren't sociopaths would pretend to be. A lot of times when they were doing experiments on people, they were being forced to, they would ridicule their victims to be able to make them non-human in their eyes so that they could psychologically proceed with what they're being forced to do, the experiments that they're being forced to do. So, yeah, I mean, we have um, non-sociopaths you know, pretending to be sociopaths and getting into that energy and being very convincing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, thank Wait, you. I'm sorry. You, 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 we, we need to move on. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Tora. Thanks so much for sharing your story, both of you. Um, I have a question about, do you have a simple statistic, Corey, for the energy consumption of repressing memories? Um, the, the energy that it pulls from your like light body and psyche? No, well, yeah, just in general. You know, like how much does it cost you in productivity to repress, have those memories repressed? Just a simple statistic. I, I don't really have a mathematical statistic, but what has been related to me is more on the, long, the lines of um, these traumas lowering your, I guess, density. They become anchors in different parts of your light body. And as these energy changes are occurring, all these cosmic energies coming in, we're supposed to be to a point where we're clear and it just rushes past us and and, and we're taken up with the energies. But instead, all of these traumas are like anchors and they interact with this energy and keep us anchored into this third density way of thinking. When we start to deal with each of those little anchors, we allow more and more of this energy to flow through us with no resistance, and we become a part of of that flow of energy. Okay, thank you. And thanks for sharing your story, and I'm sorry for what you've experienced and everything. Thank you. If you can see my light, it's also inside of you, or you wouldn't be able to see it. Okay. Um, You're very amazing and inspiring, and I I had a very strong heart connection to your story. And I was wondering, um, you know, before you came to Earth, and and that part of the story and the reptilians, I really connected to that. And I wondered um, if you have any idea what type of being you were, if it was a a feline race or or what? Um, What I see is the Laren race is we had long, dark hair. We have uh, blue skin, kind of almost a turquoise blue. And turquoise is one of my favorite colors, actually. And and we didn't have language. We could make sound if we wanted to, but we didn't have names either. We knew each other by our energy. 
and um, I don't remember being uh, like lion looking, though some people have said that that's what Lyrans look like. Um, but I remember seeing my mother, um, and she is so beautiful, and she loved me so much. And she had this beautiful long dark hair and these beautiful big liquid eyes and uh, and then this beautiful blue skin and the blue skin would darken in the sunshine just like ours does. Um, it's, it, she's they're very very beautiful people. And uh, Avatar, the movie Avatar. Um, I guess I read an article where James Cameron had had a dream about um, this world. Uh, 20 years before making the movie, but and he wanted to make it into a movie, but the kind of technology to make the kind of movie he wanted didn't exist yet. Then finally, when it did, he made the movie. Um, so I have to wonder if he isn't somehow part of the tribe that had the memory and had the and and it was actually a past life recall for him, because. When I watched Avatar for the first time, and they were landing, and they were flying over this big uh, open pit mine, uh, it was like watching a scene from my own past, where the reptilians were digging up our world and destroying it, and then turning on us. And uh, that was it, was, it was a very powerful movie for me to watch. I only wish that the animals on our planet would have risen up against those uh, reptilians. They still may yet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, how much time do we have, Renee? How much time do we have? Uh, we have uh, 13 minutes. 13 minutes, mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, hello, thank you. Yeah. Just a quick um, something about the Standing Rock. I felt compelled to share the power of unity, which you were talking about, is such a great example there for the rising of our people in this nation mm -hmm. that have been suffering for so long. Um, there was a beautiful moment that existed prior, that took place prior to the infiltration with the military presence that was the veterans that were there that did come to support. And I don't know if anybody saw the footage, but I just wanted to mention that. Were you there? No, I had, oh, okay. family, I had cousins and family members okay. from my um, Dry Creek Pomo, Mishiwawapo, uh, Sonoma County, Napa, Mendo. Um, that's all traditional territory, um, yeah. Lake County as well. So I did have family members. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I was dealing with my daughter who had gone out of surgery. Otherwise, I would have been there because I had such a tremendous calling, but I was torn. So I had family, and there was some beautiful footage of a moment where the veterans came together with the elders that were... Um, keeping the fire and they got on their knees and bowed and asked for forgiveness yeah, and it was so such bad. a beautiful moment of healing you know so all of that power so in that way I also wanted to um, offer you a deep bow of gratitude for that beautiful song medicine that you offered earlier and I was wondering where where that came from the voice just was so piercing in my heart and it was just so beautiful uh, the, the singing um well, I don't know, it's just something that's always been a part of me. Um, the forgiveness is a very important concept. I remember when two people that have been enemies find a common ground and come together, it's a really powerful moment. I remember in the movie Enemy Mine about a reptilian uh, who was a single-sexed reptilian and then a human were marooned on a planet together and they hated each other. They were trying to kill each other. And then the, the reptilian captured the human, was kind of keeping him captive. And the human fell into this pit that was like a giant uh, antlion pit, and it was pulling him down. And the reptilian ended up saving him, he gave him a hand and pulled him out. And uh, Davich said, why the heck did you save me? You've been trying to kill me since we got there. And he says, maybe because I need to look in another face, even a face as ugly as yours. <laughs> and then they became really good friends, and Davich ended up raising his child because he died giving birth to its child. Yeah, that, I mean, those kinds of things are very moving. You know, when two enemies come together and find their common ground, there is nothing more beautiful. And I want to see more of that in the world.
I saw the footage that you were speaking about of uh, the the tribal leaders being meeting with the group that bowed before them and asked for forgiveness. You notice that did not come from government. It's never going to come from government. We have a collective karma that we have to deal with when it comes to race, and it's going to be a part of. It's going to have to happen before we have this cosmic renaissance. You know, we, we need people that represent the, us, the people, to do that with different races that have been um, subjugated and put into slavery. It's not going to come from the government. If we want healing between the race, different races, belief systems, then we're going to have to be the healing. Those, the people that did that were a beautiful example, and I hope we see more of that. Yeah. The perfect example of the power of forgiveness. The, the perfect again? example of the power of forgiveness with a, a simple, true, heartfelt apology. It it moved waves mm -hmm. among all the hundreds of tribes that stood up I representing know. this country, yeah, or representing it, the nations prior to the country. Uh, it moved a lot of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. Um, my question was actually going to be um, about Standing Rock, ironically, and. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's what I want to know and what I was going to use as the example. Why don't you name more names? Why is it always the powers that be? Mm -hmm. And I noticed in your slide you wanted to quickly get rid of the one with, you know, the former presidents, et cetera. Yeah. Are you afraid of being sued? What's going on? No. Why are you afraid to name more names? And not just you, mm -hmm. your group, your ufology movement, whatever you want to call this. It's not about wanting to hide names. It's... Um it's, the reason I wanted to move past certain slides is because I just wanted to make a point and then move on to something more positive. Okay. That was about pretty much well, it. One thing I do want to point out is that... But there is a lot of redaction in this movement. There, I hate that word, well, redacted. I, I think the names are out there, the names that we know. Okay. You know, all of the Rockefellers, all of these, all of these Soros's, these different groups that we think are the elite. But these people are proxies. The people that and they have been identified in, in, the, in ufology, mm -hmm. these people have been identified as being the elite, the puppet masters, but they're puppets themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, and they're just realizing that, and that's, yeah. that's something really difficult to come to terms with, I'm sure. Right. But that was going to be, like, my example was actually, you know, like, about Standing Rock, and I forget where it just happened in the question, the line of questioning was, there was a particular person who infiltrated the movement. Who was that? Do you know? Can you name a name? I don't, I was not there, okay. but uh, I, I don't know. Okay, I, I think what I heard was there was a certain veteran who came and infiltrated up yeah, there. General That's what I just pretend. heard. That was uh, Vivian, so I'm sorry for interrupting here. Um, you know, but no, but they're not qualified to answer that question because that was from Vivian's story. And Vivian's not here. Oh, that, that's, that's why I just asked. I said, where did that come from? And if you knew that name, could you name yeah, it? Vivian, the, Vivian Davis. That's an example. And you it, you it's could an, talk to Vivian Davis, and she could probably give you that name. But okay, that wasn't thanks. a part of her uh, testimony this morning. She didn't give all of that information. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I wasn't here this morning. So, like, But that's just an example. Right. Like, you know, you can't get sued, and nobody has power over you if you're naming a name and you can prove that they did something. True. Okay. But also, most of these people come in as cutouts, not using their real name, most of these operatives. So uh, they'll give you a name, and then you'll be like, well, you know, this name, so-and-so, you know, came and infiltrated us. They look, well, there's no such person. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they, they disassociate uh, from the people doing the actual... You know what? You want unity? Let people ask more questions and tell their stories. Okay. Nick, we are allowing for more questions. Thank you. With love and light. Hello. I'm very hesitant to come up after that. Mm. Take a breath. We love you. You kissed me. Yeah. Thank you. I needed to 
state publicly after your comments about PTSD. Because what you said was absolutely accurate. What both of you have said about being suicidal is incredibly accurate. I have been asked to publicly let all of you know that I did try to kill myself. That is something that is part of me. And I suffered from PTSD. I thought I understood why. I don't. Mm -hmm. But it's not with me anymore. It was taken away that pain that was so traumatic mm -hmm. that my husband said I would wake up from a sound sleep gasping for breath. And he didn't know what was wrong with me either. I was in a coma. Mm -hmm. And they came to my husband because they had done an MRI and an EEG. And asked him if he was ready to pull the plug. He was not. And the next day I awoke. Mm. So I am here to tell a story. I don't even know what it is. But I am alive. And I am grateful every single day that I am here. And my heart is for the ascension of all of us and for this planet. Thank you very Thank much. You. you know, suicide has hit my family pretty hard. I had a, a good friend that had PTSD that ended up taking his life. But sadly, there have been a lot of young people that have taken their life, especially on my wife's side of the family. And I think that this world is so foreign to those of us that consider ourselves starseeds. I've often said it's like living underwater. Many are just trying to escape the pain. They don't understand this reality. So hopefully, through these different initiatives that we're doing, we can find a way to reach all these people and guide them away from that terrible mistake. Next, please. Kind of a mundane question here after that one. Um, that person who left kind of I'm going to put my question into perspective. Uh, one thing that I admi admire about the uh, cabal, the elite, whatever you want to call them, is their power to unite. They really have it down. No matter what their differences are, they really know how to come together as one and control us. How can we do the same? What's your perspective? How can we not be bickering about you know, I have uh, my ducks in a row, and you, 1%, what you say is not true, I cannot, whatever. So what can we do to respect uh, uh, each other and come together as one strong, cohesive unit? Mm -hmm. Well, the one thing that I think is important to give other people is acceptance of where they're at. And some people will even fight against that. They'll think that that's some kind of trick to... Uh, entice them so sometimes I think you just there's some people you just have to stand back from and let them come to their own realizations that's what I would say yeah that's that's good yeah. mm -hmm. yep. I th but I do think that we're beginning to see the unification occurring I mean it's yeah I mean no one it forced 
you to be here. A lot of you moved around quite a bit to be here. You felt led to be here. So I think we're being drawn into unity. It's not, I don't think it's necessarily something that we try to, that we need to try to evoke, invoke on the community. I mean, we're, we're feeling the need to come together now. The only thing that we need to be aware of are infiltrators and um, 